Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's class. Today, we are going to start off with apostolic ministry. Uh, I would like to request one of us to please lead in prayer, and then we will get into learning more about this uh, subject. So uh, who would like to pray today? Yes, Jeffina, please go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, we pray that as we are entering into this new subject, you will help us to open our heart and mind and listen to the deep truths of the Bible that Pastor is teaching us. Be with us and reveal the things that you want us to know, Jesus. Let your revelation fill us. And let everything that we've learned here be a blessing to others and us as well. Let your name be glorified. I pray for all my classmates who are here and who are about to come. Help us to have a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session so that without any distraction, we can keep getting deeper into it. Be with us and guide us in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jafina. Um, so... The subject that we are delving into is apostolic ministry. We have just covered prophetic ministry. Now, these two terms are familiar because we understand the fivefold ministry offices that have been, uh, you know, given by Christ as a gift to the church. So, individuals come into those offices, but then these ministries we've seen. Uh, particularly uh, prophetic ministry that it's not limited just to a prophet but we can have a prophetic ministry at all levels believers prophesying uh, people in the prophetic ministry the grace gift uh, and then ultimately you have the office of a prophet now apostolic ministry is very similar it's a uh, we, we will see the functions, how the functions uh, are slightly different from the prophetic uh, ministry. But then we will learn as we go through this course that, yes, there are apostles, but the ministry as such is open at different levels to believers as well. Okay? So very similar to the prophetic ministry. So what are some of the uh, topics that we are going to cover here? We'll just have an introduction about what apostolic ministry uh, is and why we should talk about it today. Then we will look at apostolic ministry in the New Testament, the rise of apostles. We'll understand how apostles are uh, really prepared and launched by God to do the work that he wants them to do. We'll also go ahead and uh, uh, try to understand the function and characteristic of the present day apostolic ministry. How does it look uh, in our current scenario and situation? Because obviously, the first century church uh, was a certain uh, way, but then now so much has changed. So how is it that apostolic ministry can impact the world? And then we will uh, talk more about you know apostolic ministry and its impact on a city, nation, so on and so forth. Uh, and as we discussed in the prophetic ministry, some practical uh, aspects of the ministry that one must uh, understand and uh, one must take into account. We, we looked at some concerns also, right, of the prophetic ministry. Similarly, the apostolic ministry, what could be some of the concerns? We will look into that. So. Let's start off now from chapter one here in our notes. Here we have an uh, enlisting of uh, the moves of God, the restorative moves of the Holy Spirit, which I'm sure you have studied in uh, uh, church history uh, and uh, missions. Now, we know that God has a way of strengthening his body, uh, his body of believers and restoring his work. Okay, in a powerful way in his body. So as we look at the uh, church, the first century church was definitely very powerful. Uh, no, no doubts about it. But things turned around uh, somewhere towards, you know, uh, up to 400 BC. We know that the earth, oh, uh, sorry, uh, 400 to 
1400 AD. Uh, that's the timeline. The church became a feeble entity. There is something known as the Dark Ages uh, in, in church history, where the church, the kind of power that it demonstrated during the first century uh, was not there anymore. So there were many reasons why this, this actually happened. Uh, but overall, the power of God was not uh, the way it should be. And so whenever we see the church going into uh, a, a, a place of weakness, we know that God does something. God moves upon his church and he uh, restores the strength of his church. So the moves of God, as uh, they have been recorded in history, uh, are listed out in the 1500s. We know that there was the Protestant movement. The main uh, theme of the Protestant movement is salvation by grace through faith. Okay, So let me just quickly pause here. Uh, have you all already done done this in some other course? Have you done uh, church history, the moves of God, the restoration of church? Yes, we did, Pastor. Yes? yes? I think we did in church history and restoration. Okay, so you've done it in detail. Okay. All right. Thank you for uh, letting me know. Yes, Brother Success, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I didn't get your question very well, ma'am. Okay. What I'm asking is, uh, in the history of the church, right, the global church, there are yes, moves of restoration that have taken place over the years. Okay. Yes, we that is true. Uh, yeah. Yes, we so are. this... Yes has been covered in many courses i'm just checking whether you've already you've already gone through this or not your batch yes you have okay yes yes thank you thank you thank you for the clarity so i'll just uh, go over it in a quick way so now that I know that you are already aware of this. There have been all these moves of God. So the 1500s was the Protestant movement, 1600s, the Puritan movement, 1700s, the Holiness movement, um, so on and so forth, right? So the 1900s, you know, uh, 1800s, the healing movement, 1900s, the Pentecostal movement. So the Pentecostal movement is that place from where the baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, became so important to the church. Not that it wasn't happening, but the importance of the baptism in the Holy Spirit flowing in the gifts of the Spirit became so, so um prominent through the moves of God. Uh, all of us would, would recall uh, a revival such as the Azusa Street Revival, the Welsh Revival, around this time, early 1900s is when it, it took place. So uh, God is continuously restoring you know, truth and the work of his spirit in his church. So in the 2000s, the emphasis seems to have moved to uh, the restoration of the fivefold uh, ministries okay the fivefold ministries and also the restoration of the fivefold ministry uh, gifts such as the evangelist the apostle uh, the pastor the teacher the prophet so uh, earlier they were still functional but the body of Christ has now started understanding the, uh, the value that God places on these ministries. So as you would uh, agree with me, there is more that is being spoken of regarding the prophetic ministry, not just in one church, but across the globe. You have people discussing, you know, hey, prophecy, prophets, this is how the gift flows, and you know so many details of the uh, prophetic ministry. Similarly, apostolic, apostolic gift, apostolic ministry, apostles, there is some kind of an understanding that is coming to the body of Christ. So how is this happening? It's happening because it's like a move of God. 
that is coming through and god is god is granting this revelation to establish the church uh, i remember as a uh, you know uh, college student whenever i used to go for meetings and things like that uh, they would term in those days they would term the time that we live in as uh, or the move the move of god as something like the move of the saints okay where god is equipping ordinary believers in the church but how is he equipping them as ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 teach us uh, god equips the body through the fivefold ministry offices so he puts these people in their positions so that the saints movement as many have termed the age that we live in right now where it's not so much about only a pastor or only a prophet you know some somebody who is called at that cat, uh, capacity and uh, uh, they are the ones who are leading the church so the focus is not just on them but what's happening around the world is people are being equipped ordinary believers or you want to call them saints they are being equipped how are they being equipped god is restoring the position of the apostle, the position of the prophet, the position of the teacher, the position of the prophet, the position of the evangelist. So as God is doing that, the body is being equipped. Let's quickly read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. So I would appreciate it if uh, uh, somebody here can uh, quickly turn to that. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. That becomes our key passage to understand the ministry gifts. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Yes, thank you, Jafina. So as we can notice there, it's so clear. What is the responsibility of uh, uh, the fivefold ministry offices? Their responsibility is to equip the saints. I'm looking at the amplified uh, version of the Bible here. Okay. I think somebody's mic needs to be muted. Okay. Uh, so here, amplified version, verse 12, it says, and he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints or in the brackets it says God's people for works of service to build up the body of Christ in the bracket the church so this is God's plan he is building the body which is you and me through the gifts that he has given the church who are the fivefold ministry offices and you know we have talked about the prophet in the past class but now we are going to discuss about the apostle and see how is it that the apostle uh, really strengthens god's work and god's people now who is the ultimate uh teacher who who do you think that is the ultimate teacher as far as the bible is concerned Holy Spirit. Okay, Holy Spirit, uh, God, right? If I, yes, Divya? Jesus. Jesus, okay, fine. So uh, we for, go back to the Godhead that ultimately, yes, it's Jesus, you know, who taught with authority. When he came into the picture, he came into the scene, it was a different dynamic. And even the Pharisees looked at him and said, wow, you know, uh, so much clarity, so much authority. Who is this person? So Jesus is the ultimate teacher. And now we know now that Jesus is in heaven. Uh, the Holy Spirit continues guiding us, leading us, uh, prompting us, okay, uh, uh, reminding us of the words of Jesus. Now, in the same manner, if we consider you know, who is the ultimate, uh, you could say, pastor, the Bible does say the chief shepherd will appear. Okay, so 
the chief shepherd is jesus he is the ultimate pastor so when we look at the fivefold ministry offices even if you want to take something else you know evangelist or a prophet we know that jesus functioned in all these offices okay and when we read about the life of jesus and the work of the holy spirit uh, in the life of jesus the bible says he had the spirit without measure and one of the ways in which that is interpreted is it is said that jesus falls in all five five offices okay so that's why the spirit without measure is uh, something that is used for him uh, because ultimately by the holy spirit he was anointed for all these offices uh, so then jesus is an apostle also where in the bible does it say that he's an apostle hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 uh, if somebody is there could you please turn to hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 Hebrews chapter three verse one, and so dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. Thank, thank you, Jeffina. Uh, I'll just quickly read for us the. amplified version here it says therefore holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling uh, thoughtfully and attentively consider the apostle and high priest whom we confessed as ours when we accepted him as savior namely jesus so who is it talking about it's talking about jesus how is it introducing this verse how is it introducing the lord jesus as apostle and as high priest so the bible is quite clear that jesus is an apostle when we say he is an apostle what does it really mean so when we look at that word apostle okay the meaning of that word is a representative a representative with you could say authority you said the representative with authority to get some work done that person uh, is what we understand as an apostle so if you go into the greek and look at the exact meaning of the word apostle it is sent one or a delegate sent one or a delegate so that greek word apostolos if you break it up apos uh, or apo would mean from and stolos is i sent so somebody is sent from or by somebody and that is the actual you know understanding of apostle means somebody is sent forth to do something okay with authority a representative of another with authority of course uh, and this term why is the word apostle used in the new testament well if you go back to history you would notice that during the new testament times this word apostle was a secular term uh, it was not really a church term it was a secular term it was used by the greeks and the romans uh, to describe special envoys okay that were sent on uh, assignment to new regions so you can look at it this way uh, the empires would conquer places and then they would send their apostles into those regions now the res the responsibility of the apostles was to establish the rule and reign of that kingdom so let's say you know uh, there's a greek uh, uh, king and uh, he has taken over the a particular region so he will send his apostles 
and what will they do there there will be the old culture of that place the old culture the old system and uh, the old ways of thinking the old ways of uh, uh, you know doing uh, uh, stuff but this person his responsibility is change all the old ways and now that this territory belongs to that greek king he will make sure that it looks like a replica of the greek towns and the greek uh, cities <coughs> where the uh, systems are the same as the actual greek cities so i hope you're understanding you know what i'm trying to say is that okay does that make sense yeah so yes. okay that's great okay great so that's how we understand an apostle an apostle is a person in those days who would go to a new region established kingdom values which they carry on that new place and make it you know a part of the kingdom so that is an apostle uh, so their responsibility was a subdue instruct uh, you may say uh, you know even convert convert in the sense a transform transformation of the old ways okay uh, maybe old government systems uh, old um, you know some some cultural practices so they will change it change it to their own systems uh, maybe even religious practices you know they would impose uh, during those times they would also try to train the people uh, uh, on on the systems of their own land and finally establish uh, their rule and reign such that the subjects of that region are now followers of your original empire and in that manner we know uh, we talk about world history uh, so many nations have done this right like they've gone and conquered uh, weaker nations and established their own culture over there maybe not completely but to a large extent so that is the understanding of what apost apostolic means so an apostle is a delegate or a representative who goes to establish uh, the culture of the kingdom that he or she comes from uh, and uh, the lord jesus when we call him the ultimate apostle why is he called the apostle because he was sent by the father you see as a representative or a delegate he was sent by the father and we know that he he uh, he became the express image of god so best representation of god ever and that's what the bible says and uh, he did a fantastic job and that's how when we talk about the apostolic today we understand establishing kingdom culture you know should happen uh, through that apostolic anointing and through that apostolic ministry so I just want to share with us uh, we are not talking about you know uh, uh, overthrowing any national uh, or uh, regional culture it's it's not at all about those matters it's more about kingdom culture okay uh, i i am sure if you've done that course on kingdom builders uh, in your uh, second year you know about kingdom culture it's 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 far supersedes uh, the regular earthly systems that we are talking about we're talking more about values we're talking about worship we're talking about you know spiritual matters uh, uh, in mainly those spiritual matters so that is what we are talking about now jesus is the ultimate uh, apostle we all agree with that but when we look at the bible you have categories of apostles okay and we will discuss this simply to recognize that today as we term someone as an apostle maybe they they fall in that category maybe they are positioned in the office of a, uh, of an apostle but their function may look very different from what we see in the bible like we can pick an apostle in the bible and say oh look at this person uh, they were like this they were like that and look at the uh, apostle that we are talking about you know, in today's uh, times the function may be very different the anointing and the calling would be that of an apostle 
Okay, so we have to understand when we say apostolic, it's a huge term, it's a large term. And as I started saying uh, to us earlier, that we are getting revelation because it's a move of God. Many things we don't, we may not even understand right now. But now you you could say that we're getting the words to describe uh, what what this means. Very similar to the prophetic. If you go back, let's say, 15 years ago, and uh, I want to learn more about the prophetic, back then, I'm sure some of the depths that we have today did not uh, exist because God is restoring this little by little to the church. So when we talk about the apostolic also, we have to recognize that God is giving revelation. So we are forming our understanding of the apostolic as we go along. Uh, we have some information, we have some understanding, which is what we want to share with us, uh, you know, during this course. But there's so much that uh, we, I'm sure we don't yet understand fully. And uh, when you talk about people in the apostolic office, uh, they are also in categories. So everybody will not, you know, be similar. Uh, and that we have to settle in our hearts. So even as you look at the Bible, there is something known as the apostles of the Lamb. Okay, apostles of the Lamb. They are mentioned uh, in uh, Revelation 21, 11, 14. Uh, there's a mention of the apostles of the Lamb. And we know that when uh, Judas is carried, he went against uh, uh, Jesus, there was the election of uh, another person in his place. Matthias was chosen. And in Acts 1, we read about that, you know, the election of uh, this person called Matthias. So uh, these 12 people, apostles, usually we say Jesus and his disciples and Jesus and apostles, 12 people, 12 apostles. So who are they? What would we call them? We would call them the apostles of the Lamb, because Revelation 21 verse 14 talks about them. Only 12 of them fall in that category of uh, apostles of the Lamb. Now, as we go further, we see the emergence of, uh, you know, people like uh, Paul. Now, uh, Paul, when we read Ephesians 2.20, uh, it says that the church, right, it is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. What does it mean? You see, there were some founding apostles, such as Paul, as far as the Bible is concerned. Why? Because God gave them a great responsibility of establishing doctrine. Now, can we have founding apostles today? Answer is no, because doctrine has already been established. Okay, yes, we are, we are receiving greater uh, revelation about the word of God that has been given to us already, but we cannot recreate doctrine. It's already been done. The founding apostles, such as Paul, we, when we read the New Testament, we have James, we have uh, Peter. Uh, we So in this way, right, like you, John, Apostle John, so they have given us what we require. So the logos uh, or the canon of scripture, it's already been established and uh, we cannot have founding apostles anymore. So that category also is, you know, closed. So, uh, yes, deep understanding can come, but not founding apostles anymore. Then moving on to uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, where we are told that apostles, general, you know, the term apostles. So is God establishing people from the time you know uh, this letter was written by paul up until now who are serving as representatives who are serving in in furthering the kingdom work of god yes there are a lot of people whom god is choosing he is shaping them he is positioning them to do this work and each one's work may look slightly different from the other okay so that is the ministry gift of the apostle right now uh one more thing that we want to say is that uh, both men and women can be apostles uh, why are we saying this because there is a mention of a lady called junia by uh, uh paul when he writes to the romans in romans 16 verse 7 he mentions 
this woman junia as an apostle like that uh, there is this lady and uh, she is commended by the churches commended by the believers because of her apostolic ministry so she's in the office of the prophet okay so that's a little bit about the apostolic and we will move on to uh, uh, new things soon uh, so any thoughts at this point any clarifications questions please feel free you can ask and then i'll go ahead I have a question. Yes, so, Sefifina. Yeah. So, uh, in today's, I mean, in this generation, I don't think many are termed as apostles. We call evangelists, we call them pastors, uh, we call them ministers. Um, I mean, I just heard like this once uh, that uh, only those who were with Jesus were the most we called as apostles, apostle Peter, apostles, <laughs> or something like that. Only those who were in the Bible were mostly called as apostles, but not mostly we don't see anyone of us even telling very boldly I'm an apostle of God or something. So uh, is how can we call someone an apostle? Can we call can someone name give them that title? <laughs> mostly everyone calls themselves as the five four like uh, evangelists, pastors. It's very common. So if they don't have a church, they mostly call themselves as evangelists. And when they have a church, they say they call themselves as pastor. So uh, I haven't seen anyone in my life uh, mentioning themselves as an apostle. Uh, so I just want to clarify this. Like, how can we term someone as an apostle? Can we term like that all? Okay. So uh, yes. Jafina, it's a you know really uh, pertinent question. Who is an apostle? How do we identify an apostle? Okay, that's that's what we uh, are trying to understand. So very similar to the prophetic ministry, when we understand, you know, uh, that somebody somebody's life, somebody's ministry is demonstrating a set of features. That they are prophesying, uh, and not just that they carry governmental authority. We said they uh, receive receive uh, messages from God for the church, for the direction of the church, for the direction of the nation, for uh, instructing political leaders. So when we see all this, then we usually say, "Ha, huh, here is a prophet." Similarly, to look at people around us and call them or term them an apostle we have to understand the features of the apostolic ministry okay so we are going to go through that now once you understand the features of the apostolic ministry then we are able to term them okay they carry all these features so we can conclude that such and such a person is an apostle Okay, so that's how we would go. I'm not going into the features because that's the next chapter here. Anyway, we have to discuss that. So if you can hold on, uh, we, we will go through the features. Uh, is that okay? All right. Uh, Rosalind, uh, she says, can we call a pastor who has founded many churches as apostle? All right. So Rosalind, we will study that just having more number of ministries doesn't make one an apostle. I know that presently that seems to be the understanding in the body of Christ, uh, but a pastor can have multiple churches, uh, but he may not necessarily be an apostle. Is that okay? Oh, you have any follow up question to that? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing uh, Rosalind is fine with that. All right. So let's now uh, go ahead and discuss some of the features of the apostolic ministry. Now, we said there were 12 apostles of the Lamb. So when Jesus was with them, they were sent out. 
in Matthew chapter 10, if you recall verses 1 and 2, he sent them. He said, okay, you go, do the ministry. Go, uh, you know, um, uh, demonstrate the power of God. So they went as representatives of Jesus even before the cross because that was always God's idea. He didn't want to, uh, you know, be the only one who's doing the work of the ministry. But he sent his disciples they were with him they were trained uh, and uh, he gave them the courage and he said okay now you go he sent them out so this is in matthew chapter 10 in case you all want to read it we can or i will quickly read it for us yeah so jesus summoned his uh, I'm, I'm reading from the amplified jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority and power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness now these are the names of the 12 and then it lists it begins to list them out okay uh, 12 apostles it says uh, and Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and then it goes on. So 12, uh, very clearly, okay, 12 disciples of Jesus are mentioned. They were sent out to do what? To uh, have authority over unclean spirits, cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So what are they doing? Remember, we said establish the kingdom. So Jesus is coming from the heavenly kingdom where there's no work of the enemy, there's no sickness, no disease. So what is he doing now? He's sending his representatives and he's say, saying, you go. You establish the kingdom wherever you go. That is apostolic ministry. Sent forth, sent from. Okay, uh, uh, Ambassadors. Ambassadors is another term. Uh, so we, we can... Uh, Come, we will come to that later. So when Jesus was with them, he sent them out. Now when Jesus ascended up into heaven, what happened? These men, their courage, you know, it, it multiplied. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the work of God took off like anything. Okay, it's like generally when we talk about the acts of the apostles, seems like a, like a, you know, a spark that, became a forest fire. It was powerful. It was like a revival that broke out uh, in the church. And uh, these 12 disciples, now we term them as 12 apostles, they started, uh, uh, you know, like leading the work of uh, th that revival. What were some of the things that they did? In our notes, a lot of scriptures are mentioned. I won't be reading through each one. Otherwise, you know, we'll have to do uh, very many classes. Uh, but summarizing, summarizing uh, what these verses are talking about, we notice that these apostles were teaching. Okay. When we read in the book of Acts, we are told uh, that the teaching which was passed on to the new believers is the apostles' doctrine. Apostles' doctrine. What is that? The things that they had learned from Jesus, and we also know that Jesus was dedicated to uh, the uh, the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament books, because he went to the synagogue, he read the scripture. So that way, the books that Jesus was committed to, I'm sure he passed it on to the apostles, and they also learned additionally teachings of Jesus. So these are known as apostles doctrines they obviously will teach only what they have learned from jesus so they learned they taught the scriptures they taught the teachings of jesus so they were teachers they were passing it on and you notice that it's called as apostles doctrine that's what was being taught to the people and uh, when a persecution came scriptures say that uh, you know they and said lord no signs wonders miracles done through the hands of the apostles and uh, peter and john they uh, were part of that incredible miracle the man who couldn't walk for 40 years the lame man uh, you know peter went to him he said silver and gold i don't have but what i have i give to you in the name of jesus rise up and walk and this man who's never walked his entire life the whole city knows that you know he's been he's uh, been this way suddenly he's walking he's jumping and it became the talk of the town so it's a it's a sign it's a wonder it's a miracle that took place so when we read about peter john 
Paul, uh, uh, even Barnabas, you notice know that they are moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. Okay, so that's another feature. Teaching the doctrine, that's one feature. Signs, wonders, miracles, that's another feature. And these are all descriptions of the early apostles. Okay, let's move on. Uh, church administration. So things had to be uh, decided for the church. And in Acts chapter 15, you have James who uh, oversees a meeting regarding the decision of circumcision uh, for the Gentiles. So what are they doing? They are administering, they, they, they are guiding the church on what decisions to make, how to take things forward, uh, practical issues, right? Uh, uh, biblical issues. So they, are, they have a say on these matters. And church government, church administration uh, is, in that would come, how did they structure the church? So as you look at you know, the, the growth of the church, you would see, you initially have only the apostles. And slowly, they start taking in volunteers. So Acts chapter 6, when they need people to serve food, they pick seven men, okay, uh, full of the Holy Spirit, good report, and they assign them. Then as you keep reading the New Testament, suddenly you uh, hear terms like elders. You hear uh, terms such as, you know, bishop. Uh, so what's happening? New roles are emerging volunteers, pastors, leaders. So church administration is being formed. And uh, you would notice that as the churches were planted, leaders were raised up in all those churches. So this was all part of the apostolic work that one needed to do. And they were actually doing these things. So church administration, uh, church government, that was a great responsibility that the apostles carried. Preaching. Preaching is what? Preaching is um, teaching. Yes, you take the truth of the word, you break it down, and you know you you help people uh, understand it and follow through. Preaching is when you proclaim, when you declare the truth of God's word, when you declare the gospel. If you recall, Peter on the on that first day he stood up and he started preaching. Right on the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, what happened? Three thousand people got saved. Like wow, Peter, we didn't even know you could preach this well. He, you know. And scriptures say, and suddenly, and we don't know if he was thinking of uh, this, this sermon and he wanted to preach a sermon, but it just happened on that day. He was preaching and that was not the last time. But you notice that he went around preaching, so did all the other apostles, and they trained believers also to go ahead and preach. Right. So preaching was a huge part of what apostles did. Um, then leadership providing leadership to the uh, church, instructing the church. Uh, and you also notice that they became the greatest targets of persecution. Uh, so initial chapters of the Book of Acts, you would see that when uh, the healing of that lame man happened, Peter and John were in trouble. Okay, They were the ones who were, uh, they were caught and then they were, uh, uh, you know, they were commanded not to, uh, instructed not to preach in the name of Jesus and that there will be dire consequences. So ultimately, they became the targets of persecution. Persecution was happening in general, but the uh, authorities wanted to get rid of the apostles first. And unfortunately, as you go uh, till Acts chapter 12, you see that James, right? One of the James was killed uh, is what we read. He was already killed. And then you have uh, Peter, who is put into the prison. So the, the people were targeting the apostles because they knew once you get rid of the leaders, you can easily cause confusion for the followers. So they became the target of persecution. Then what else are they doing apostles? These apostles, they were strengthening the local church. You know, you, it's really beautiful to see that when the church in Samaria uh, they got news about uh, people believing. Philip went, he did, he's an evangelist. So he went, he did some ministry over there. And the church in Jerusalem heard, oh, there's a new church in Samaria. Now, you know what? They could have just been happy about it, sent reports saying, we have a new church. I close the matter. But that's not, it's not what they did. They knew that this church has to be strengthened. So immediately they send out apostles for the next step. What is the next step? baptism in the Holy Spirit. So you have apostles from Jerusalem coming in to strengthen the church in Samaria. Philip is gone. Evangelist did his work and he went to the next region. But 
that church is not left out. They are building the church, right? They are strengthening the church. Many things have to be done in that church. People have to be taught. Leaders have to be appointed. So that is apostolic. When we are strengthening the church, and that's what the apostles did, early apostles, and expanding into new territory. So as I told us, Jerusalem was the place where the mighty Holy Spirit was poured out and you know, wonderful things happened. They could have said, oh, we are in the best place. We are in the center right, of uh, 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 Israel. So let's just be here. Let's be happy. But that wasn't enough. You see that they start moving, you know, Samaria, Judea, different parts of the region. And eventually, we'll see later, founding apostles like Paul come into the picture and they take new territory. Now you have the, uh, you know, the Asia Minor regions where they go. The max that they could cover with the transportation they had, the opportunities they had, the opposed they had, they did it. Okay, they were not just limited to Jerusalem. And uh, so these are some of the features of the early apostles. So I hope you're getting an idea. Uh, I'm sure whatever we're sharing is helping to build a picture right of the uh, 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 ministry of the apostle so just think about it let's uh, take a break we will come back and uh, feel free to ask questions uh, feel free to discuss okay so uh, yeah and i see rosalind's comment here saying uh, she lost her connection uh, that's fine that's fine rosalind no problem Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. 10 minutes break. Let's come back at 10 a.m. and then we'll discuss some more. Thank you so much. <laughs> 